there, everyone. Welcome to Stony Creek Church. We are just about to begin our service, so if you are out in the hallway, come on into the auditorium and prepare for our worship experience. After we sing praise to God, we will have our time of offering. Then we will be joined by special guests, Chris and Hannah Nelson, to bring us this morning's message. Speaking of that offering, if you're new with us today, we don't want you to worry about it. That is a time for regular attenders to give to the ministry here. We would, however, love to get to know you better. One of the best ways to take your next step is to simply fill out that connection card in your program. After service, bring it to the Welcome Center in the entryway, and we have a gift for you with some info on the church, a great mug, and even some chocolate. Also, if you are newer to the church, we have an opportunity for you coming up next Sunday, June 9th. Right after our 1130 service that day, we have our free newbie lunch. This Jets Pizza lunch for the whole family is the perfect opportunity to meet some of the staff and ministry leaders at the church. Write newbie lunch on your connection card so we can plan for it and send you a reminder. For those of you who call Stony Creek Church home, we've got a real easy way for you to invite friends to an upcoming service. Just grab a few of these small invite cards at the Welcome Center as you leave today and use them to share a simple invite to church with you. Make sure you keep a couple on hand to share with your neighbors or friends when the conversation comes up. One last thing to note, our Vacation Bible School planning meeting is scheduled for this Saturday at 11 a.m. There are still some specific spots where we need your help. Check out the flyer in your program this morning to see where you can serve. Drop it in the offering bag when it comes around or sign up at my.stonycreek.church on your smartphone anytime. Let's rally together, church, and make this year's VBS a life-changing moment for our kids. What a wonderful day to be a part of Stony as we continue to make more and better followers of Jesus. Now let's stand together as we prepare our hearts to sing praises to our God.
Amen. Well, let's continue in song together. Sing a song that I'm sure you're all familiar with. But what a great truth it is that we get to sing of God's amazing grace. So let's join in song together. again to Stony Creek Church. We had our video welcome and announcements before praise, but I have one special live announcement that I wanted to make personally because we have some graduating seniors to celebrate together as a church family. Here they are. That's Jaden Batani. We've got Paige Gold, Hannah Lanuza, Hannah Theory, a lot of Hannahs up there, just percentage-wise. We have Chloe Walsh, and all the way from Singapore, we have Ethan Weaver. So let's hear it one more time for the class of 2019. (laughs) 
I'm the youth director here. If you're visiting for one of the first times, my name is Chris, and so I get to say congratulations to each of you guys. We're very proud of you. I'd like to pray for these graduates, and then we'll pray over the offering. The ushers can prepare for that, and we'll, we'll be doing that here in just a moment. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these six lives, these 2019 graduates. Lord, I thank you that each one of them has come to the point in their life where, where they decided to put their trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives. You've gotten them to this point and this next uh, big milestone in their life, but Lord, we pray for your rich blessing as they move forward into college and career and whatever you have for them. May they follow you closely, Lord. And everywhere they go, I pray they would shine brightly, that they would tell people the, the story of what you've done for them, and they would invite people to trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, wherever they go, in a class, in a work setting, with friends and family. May they be your ambassadors, we pray in Jesus' name. And Lord... We, we pray over this offering that we're about to give. This is not uh, a way of paying you back for the blessings you've given us, Lord. This is an act of worship and thanksgiving. And so, Lord, we pray for your blessing and that every penny would be used to advance your kingdom, to accomplish your will far beyond the borders of this church building. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we give together this morning, let's stand and we'll continue our worship in song. Oh, 
together. God, we thank you this morning. We thank you that we can sing that out. God, that you are good. God, that you are so wonderful to us. And we just praise you for that this morning, God. We thank you for everything that you have done for us, God, and everything that you are doing for us. We thank you this morning. And we just want to honor you today. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Good morning. Today, we are talking about uh, a pretty weighty topic, but an important one, one that we need to be talking about and doing something about here in church. We're talking about getting real help for life's big, I mean big, hurts and habits and hang-ups. You see, whether we bring it on ourselves in this life or someone else or something else brings it upon us, the truth is this life hurts. This life hurts. We all experience it in different ways. But equally true is that our God heals He brings real healing to all of our hurts, our habits, our hang-ups. There's real restoration and recovery in Jesus, and we need to talk about that. According to the CDC, there were 70,237 drug overdose deaths just in 2017. To give a little perspective about what a great number that is, if, you add, if we were to add the motor vehicle deaths, the gun violence deaths, and deaths because of influenza or pneumonia, in the same year, you would still be 179 lives short of those claimed from drug overdose. It's the fourth leading cause of death in America, at least it was in 2017. After, of course, abortion, which tops the chart by a landslide, sadly, and then heart disease and cancer. But for me, this is also a very personal, a deeply personal issue that we're talking about. Just two weeks ago was the eighth anniversary of the death of my little brother, Matt due to heroin overdose. He was 21 years old. That's him there next to me. And that's little Xander, little baby Xander. Sadly, he didn't get to see Xander grow up. He didn't get to even meet his nephew, Ben. Matt was plugged into ministry here at Stony. Matt was taking our Exploring the Creek membership class here at the church. But he also had an addiction. And 
he confessed it to me some years earlier before he died. And the family and I were there to encourage him and help him and to keep him accountable. And for a time, he was clean. He was on track. He was walking in recovery and victory. But Matt fell back into his habit in 2011. And this time, he didn't reach out. I don't know if he was embarrassed or afraid of the consequences or letting us down. I'm not not sure, probably a number of those things. Maybe he just didn't want to get help during that time. Whatever it was, it cost him his life. And he died in May of 2011. Are you here this morning with a deep hurt, a, a high hang-up, a real addiction? Maybe it's a substance addiction. Maybe it's pornography or something like that in your life. And you would never, never let anybody know about it. Well, we're going to talk about receiving real help from the Lord and how he offers it through his people, the church. We're going to hear from a special couple in our church that runs our Celebrate Recovery Ministry. It meets here on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. And these, these two help people to experience the healing that Jesus brings so that people can walk in recovery and victory from their trials, from the things they struggle with. And so would you please welcome now Chris and Hannah Nelson. Welcome. Welcome. You guys can sit there, yeah. <laughs> Chris and Hannah are going to share their story with you. They each have a different reason why they got involved with Celebrate Recovery and how the Lord has impacted their lives. And so we're going to hear their personal story one at a time. And I hope that if you relate, that you'll be moved to, to experience what they've experienced. And then uh, we're going to have Chris back up here to give us a little sample teaching from Celebrate Recovery, so you can see what it's like, the kind of help and, and instruction and, and encouragement you get there. So first, Chris, will you come up and share your story? I'll give you this guy here. Thanks, guys. Good to see you. We'll start with some prayer, and then we'll jump in and get this thing going. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for this, uh, this moment that we have that leads us all here. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for the work you've done on the cross that affords the forgiveness that we need to walk in the grace you've given to us. Love you, God. Uh, help us, Lord, because we don't know what we're doing. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Cool. So like Chris was saying, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. Those of you who are listeners of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, the valley is the San Fernando Valley. So anytime you guys uh, hear that in the songs, it's the valley where I grew up at. Um, grew up in a broken home. Uh, dad had left early when I was probably two uh, due to drug and alcohol addiction. Uh, mom, great single mom, did the best that she could with what, what she had. And uh, you know, until we met my stepdad uh, a few years later, um, lying and stealing and manipulating people was like what I did. Like as a kid, I just had those coping skills, I guess, to deal with life or whatever. So I could just read people instantly, figure out what they're about, and then do what I can to get as much from them as possible. That's just how I was. That's how my brain operated at the time, and that's just life. Uh, when I was 13 years old, I went to a public school. Or a, I was going to public school and then went to a, a private Christian school to help uh, straighten me out. Uh, it was there that I met a, a young man that actually changed my life for the worst, uh, where he taught me how to not uh, respect authority, that I am my own authority, and then I get to do whatever it is I wanted to do, uh, and that's just how life is supposed to be lived. And so um, that was horrible, <laughs> obviously. So a uh, quick snapshot, when I was 14 years old, I'd walk around the valley with my uh, Volcom backpack on. It had uh, ski masks, some uh, latex gloves, crowbar, and a uh, pair of bolt cutters. And that's just how I walked around. And looking back, none of that seemed weird at the time. It's very strange now, like what the heck was I thinking, an idiot kid, you know? But um, I didn't last too much longer at that Christian school. I actually lasted uh, less than the first semester uh, before they got tired of me not doing what they wanted me to do. Uh, Christians always trying to get you to submit, you know, so, <laughs> but anyway, so fast forward all this stuff, uh, just picture years and years of, of you know, uh, do whatever I wanted to do, you know, crime, all that kind of stuff came with it. Uh, when I was 15, uh, breaking, we would break into places, and the place we broke into was uh, old middle school. 
and we'd have taken about $1,000 worth of candy and Gatorade and gym shorts. Um, and then we loaded it up onto this, uh, this cart and we drove it about three miles back to my house, you know, celebrating as we're going, right, just idiot kids, right? And uh, end up getting caught for that, obviously, how could you not, you know? And uh, so I ended up getting caught and what was supposed to be one year of informal probation turned into three years of formal probation with time served. Again, because of my unwillingness to submit to very simple rules that would just keep me out of jail. Um, so fast forward from there, through uh, my not listening, the PO had come to my neighborhood and started interviewing my neighbors about what kind of kid I was. And so they told the truth, as they should, and I wound up with the, uh, facing the option of rehab or jail. So I chose rehab because it wasn't jail, until I found out that the rehab was a year-long program and jail was only three months. So I did the math real quick, turns out jail was a better option. So three months a year, you can't lose. So go through that process. When I got out, of because uh, I was in rehab for about a month, um, and at that time I really don't believe that I actually had any kind of an addiction. It was really just me, like wanting to do whatever I wanted to do. Um, when I was in there, the kids that were in there described how amazing drugs were. I mean, just like, oh, you didn't try this, you didn't try that. I'm like, no, I'm just, I've been stealing stuff. I don't, I haven't tried anything yet, you know. And so then they finally, they, you know, they let it on me. So I go out of there, and I got high for the first time, and it was like revolutionary for me. I mean, it was like it opened up worlds where I'm like, oh my gosh, this is what they're talking about. This is, this is my life. Drugs are the best, you know. And so that continued on for a few more years. Uh, until about when I was 19 years old, uh, this one night we're all partying at my friend's house and I was hit with a suitcase about three o'clock in the morning and I was told to move my car. And what it was is my friend uh, who had introduced me to doing whatever I wanted to do, they were gonna break into a cannabis club and they made me to move my car so that they can take theirs. Well, I offered to take mine because I wanted to go. So I go and we break into this cannabis club and we took about $50,000 worth of marijuana and marijuana products. As I, last time, I even grabbed a t-shirt on the way out, you know, like just totally loaded this thing up, right? So we go, go back to the house, discover that one of the suitcases, because my friends had already hit a few pharmacies that night, had left the suitcase inside of the cannabis club. So I'm like, oh no. <laughs> so I didn't stay at the house. I left that night and then I came back the next morning and the cops were already there pulling bodies out of the house and everything. I left town. I went to my dad's house to get his advice on what a situation, you know, I'm in, what should I do? And he's like, you need to stay out of town and, and you know, not get caught. So then I end up leaving, go out of town. I call back about a week later or two weeks later and I asked, what's going on? Are the cops looking for me? Who's, you know, what's going on here? And they said that, no, the cops are not looking for you. Even the, the people that own the cannabis club, they're not looking for you either. Nobody's looking for you. And I thought that was a miracle sign from heaven because, you know, I know people, I know human nature. When you get somebody in front of a cop and they're all by themselves, they're going to say everything possible to get themselves out of trouble. That's just the way it works. People always squeal every time. And so I knew that was a sign from God that he let me get away with this. And so I took that as like, oh my gosh, like this is my one shot, right? So I did what I thought was the right thing to do and I went back to church. Um, my grandparents went to a church. Uh, my grandfather was actually an elder at the church that we went back to. And I went there because I, I knew enough to know that church people didn't go to jail regularly, you know, and, and church people didn't have these sort of situations they got to get out of, right? So I go there, go to church and uh, absolute madman and then... Uh, Go there and I meet this girl uh, who had uh, come from Michigan, whatever, knew she was in town, she didn't say anything. And then finally when she had actually spoke for the first time and I heard what she had said, she said, um, or, or what she had said, I had never heard a woman speak that way before, ever. Like, you know, all, all the girls that I knew before that, they never they talked anywhere near how she was saying things and I was completely smitten. Like I knew for sure she was going to be the one I was going to marry 100%. And so uh, she would give me rides to church. She would give me uh, rides to church events because at that time I didn't have a license because I lost it. Uh, different story. And uh, she's giving me rides. And um, she told me one night that I will only ever marry a man that loves God more than he loves me. And kind of the same thing for like how the one guy changed my life trajectory by telling me I don't have to listen to authority. She changed mine by giving me a path of I need to love God more than I love her in order to get her. So God's plan obviously worked out where I end up loving God more and byproduct of that, I get her as well. So it's kind of a real win-win, right? Um, so fast forward to that, uh, the church that I, we were attending started to celebrate recovery. 
I knew I had a drug problem because during all that time God was moving in me, he took two things away from me instantly. One of them, he took away lying and stealing. I didn't struggle with that the day I gave my life to Christ. That just was gone. But the partying, the drugs, and the alcohol remained. I could not lift those things from myself. And so I'm trying to get free from this. They start a CR. I start going to this thing. And I keep trying to find every way out from being an alcoholic or an addict. I don't want to accept the fact that I can't do drugs or alcohol anymore because I really enjoy them. You know, it was still fun for me at that time. And so, uh, you know, I started attending a lot more meetings. And then one meeting I sat down in where it was explained to me, it said, Chris, you can uh, either have a wife, a house, uh, kids, picket fence, cars, career, a life, or you can have jail, homelessness, uh, drug addictions, horrible, miserable existence, and you're probably going to wind up dead. And I knew I was an addict when I had to think about it. <laughs> like weighing those options out, I'm like, okay, no, this is definitely better. I'm going to go with that, that first choice, right? So that's when I took the CR seriously, and then I ended up going, um, you know, hanging out with a buddy of mine who happened to be one of the bigger cocaine dealers where I'm from, and I'm explaining to him, like, you know, what God has done, you know, done for him through Christ and all this stuff, and he needs to stop selling drugs because he's going to end up going to prison for the rest of his life, and to which uh, we're sitting there getting high as I'm talking about this with him. Horrible witness, right? And so uh, I end up leaving, I go home, and I'm just like, on my knees, God, please forgive me, please forgive me. And then uh, I get up and I get high again with somebody else 10 minutes later. And I, that night, like the, the come down from that was absolutely horrific. I've, I've come down off a lot of drugs before, like really bad, nothing compared to that. Like feeling the emptiness and void of God in my life, everything that I built up over the last few years is now gone and lifted from me. That was horrendous. The next day I get pulled into a men's retreat where I go up and I'm expecting to get this like, you know, mountaintop experience, right? And so I go there Friday night, nothing. Saturday night, or Saturday day, nothing. Saturday afternoon, nothing. Saturday night, nothing. I'm expecting, like in the movies, how they have the, the sun coming down on you or the shining down, all of a sudden, like, oh, you know, and magic happens to me, right? That's what I was waiting on. Didn't come. That night, the guys are all laying hands over me. They're praying over me. And I'm trying to, like, force out some tears to kind of help motivate the spirit, you know, and just get him going. <laughs> you know, like, oh, no, it's serious this time, you know, and, and all that kind of thing, right? And nothing happened, so I go out in the woods. And I'm out there, and I'm just praying. I'm like, God, I don't know what i got to do. I've tried to be good for the last two years. It's not working. Like, I don't know what I have to do. This is not working. What do I got to do? And it's the one time I'd ever heard God's voice speak so clearly to me, and I know his voice because it wasn't one of my own. I know what I sound like and all the different committee that's going on up in there. And his voice was so clear, he said, I already did it. And that was it. And I was like, oh, okay. And I went in and went to bed, and the, the a drug addiction, the alcohol thing was just lifted from me, that, that slavery chain sort of a thing. And it wasn't like a mythical thing where like, I never wanted, I never thought about drugs or alcohol again. It's like, no, that the, the slavery part was broken, and now the choice remains. I can choose to go out and do that stuff if I want to. I can go choose to rob a liquor store right now, but I don't, right? So fast forward this, Hannah and I had uh, ended up getting married, to speed up her time, and uh, <laughs> Moved out here to Michigan. We spent a year out there but after we got married in California and then came out here to Michigan where we started having four beautiful kids. Um, and then the rest is kind of history. I had to exp uh, explain some of the rest of that. But just as a brief kind of to throw in there at the end, before I was 18, I genuinely believed that if I was either dead or in jail by the time I was 18, I was cool with that. Like I didn't have any sort of expectation of life that it was going to go well for me. I just literally expected horrible things. And I, I was doing horrible things at the time, so it makes sense to me. Um, but God has obviously given uh, just a ridiculous life that I do not deserve via the celebrate recovery and the work that he's put in with all this stuff. And so, step on shit. Yeah, come on. Cool. how you got plugged in with Celebrate Recovery is, is different from Chris's, so uh, please share it with us this morning. My story is a lot different. Um, I grew up caretaking. I'm actually the oldest of 13 children. My youngest brother, Kendrick, is 14. He was born the month I graduated from high school. My mom actually had cancer at the time and had gone through four rounds of chemo with him inside. It was enough chemo that she lost all her hair by then. But when Kendrick was born, God put his very own thumbprint on him and gave my brother twice the amount of hair the rest of us were born with. <laughs> God kept him safe, and they are both healthy today. With so many younger siblings, it was natural that I was a second mom. It was needed, and I had a knack for it. So that was my life growing up. 
My parents were both Christians, and we went to church every Sunday and most of the extra events. I grew up with a good youth group and gave my life to Jesus when I was young. But things were not happy at my house. My parents both had a lot of childhood baggage that they never dealt with. They fought constantly. They rarely said, I love you, or expressed it apart from taking care of us. They, um, anger and yelling were normal, and we all grew up distant from them and underdeveloped in people skills and communication. I developed bad habits of being very independent and isolated. I was painfully shy. In both my 8th and 12th grade graduating classes, I was voted shyest, and my lame little picture is cemented in history. <laughs> when I graduated from high school, I drove myself off to Iowa to attend Emmaus Bible College. After a year there, and not wanting to take out school loans without a clear career path, I decided to nanny. I moved out to Los Angeles after having been paired with a great family through an agency. This is actually the same family that Laura Schick has been working for. Um, being alone on the other side of the continent, I looked for a church to make friends. I ended up at West Valley Christian Church. This was about the same time as a guy named Chris started coming back to church. He was clearly a mess with his pre-Christ lifestyle being shockingly different than my very conservative upbringing and little Bible college certificate. I stayed away from any guy, but especially him. When I noticed, because he made it obvious that he liked me, I made him very well aware I was not interested. <laughs> partly because I was a loner and afraid of relationships, and partly because I didn't want to lead someone on who I had no intention of marrying. I said no, many times. <laughs> but then I, saw a God, uh, then I saw God unmistakably moving in him. It's one thing to always do and say the right things, being the little Miss Goody Two-Shoes that I was, but then to see God, the real living and moving God, working in someone to change them is amazing. Maybe he wasn't so bad. So I let him have a chance, and here we are. Our first kiss was at our wedding. Um, after we found out we were pregnant with Eden, I wanted to move back to Michigan to be closer to my siblings. So we did, and I had her a month later. Then we had Vera the next year. I'd always wanted to foster, so before Vera was born, we started to we started the process through Macomb County. Although we got licensed, we let it run out before getting any real placements. God brought Junior and Keon into our lives. Their mom needed help with them, but knew from experience how not to get turned into CPS. So we agreed to take them outside the system. Oops. Keeks was three months old and Junior a year. Over the next two and a half years, we had them on and off sometimes just for a couple days, and sometimes over a month before we heard from their mom. It was very hard. It was like having two sets of twins since they were the same ages as our girls. Then we added Liam to our family, our third biological baby. A couple weeks after we, were, we found out we were pregnant with Alethea, our fourth, I got a devastating phone call from Junior and Keeks' aunt. They had been home with their mom for a month. The aunt told me that their mom's ex had strangled and killed the boys to get back at their mom, and then killed her too. Then he hung himself after confessing over the phone to his own mother the day before Mother's Day, May 9, 2015. But God is so good. He saw it coming, and he gave me treasures to hold on to, assurance that they were out of pain and as happy as can be with him. The last time the boys were with us, Junior was walking around the house singing songs he learned at church with us. I'm in the Lord's army, and Jesus loved me, were his favorites. God knew it was coming, and like all the times he told his disciples about leaving before his crucifixion, they all made sense after. He has been so good to me. He is the God of the hills and valleys. My faith in God and seeing his hand in all the little things helped me forgive the man who killed my boys. I know he was in a tremendous amount of pain himself. I've seen the difference between going through this, trusting God, and how crushing and unable to move forward it has been for other family members who went through this without him. Chris told me several times over the years that he thought I should go to CR. He had been going for years already. I was a little offended. I didn't like that he thought I had problems, but we all do. I was on track, just like my parents, to try moving forward without dealing with the past. I had been trained to be cold and distant on the inside and felt like I must keep up looking perfect. Raising kids is hard. It's a lot of work and exhausting and at times isolating. I realized, especially when my boys passed, that I didn't have a support system. 
My church cried with me, but no one really did anything to help us or them before or after. My siblings helped with babysitting, but I also didn't have deep relationships with them. I didn't know how to have friendships. November 2016, I finally went to Kensington Church, uh, to CR at Kensington Church. I joined a step study in March. I wrote my heart out in every question I could in the step study books. I didn't know what my problem was, but I wanted desperately to change. By June, I could see progress in myself and had had a couple really cool experiences where I knew God was talking to me and changing me. By November 2017, when I graduated my step study, I was able to put words to the first thing holding me captive, unforgiveness. I made amends with my dad, which is something I learned he knew the importance of, but has been unwilling to do so with his own dad. Since then, God has uncovered more areas for me to work on, like anger, people-pleasing, and codependency. God did not leave me alone to figure these out, though. Like my whole life, he walks with me. I learned to have relationships with the women in my small group, which has also opened doors for me to talk to the moms around me at the kids' school. I am starting to have real friends. Recovery helped me make the decision with Chris to leave our old church and find a better place for our family to grow. Our small group at Stony Creek has been a godsend. I've learned how to say no to things, good things like service opportunities and helping people. I learned not to go crazy trying to cover trying to cover it all because my sanity and the rest of my family's sanity is important too. I've learned to be more confident in myself. I am better about expressing things I don't like in healthy ways. What took me days and weeks of resentment before to open up about, I can express in calmer conversations much sooner. This is only the beginning of my journey, but I am already not the big knot of ugly hurts and destructive habits, mostly to myself, that I once was. I have a freedom I didn't think was possible until God used CR to tear down some of the walls. I am grateful that God brought me here while my own kids are young enough that I have a shot at changing things for them. Celebrate Recovery is a safe place to come for freedom from drugs and alcohol, but it's a lot more too. The same underlying issues that lead to those addictions also express themselves in other ways, like codependency, where we enable others' dysfunction and neglect ourselves, or angry outbursts and manipulation of others, or people-pleasing, where we live under massive perfection to feel worthy. My prayer for you all is to get a glimpse of the life of freedom God has for you and to take the courageous leap to follow him. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Hannah, for sharing that. Uh, it's a, just a heartbreaking story. Um, but your, uh, the way that you realize God's faithfulness, even through such a difficult circumstance, is really an, uh, an inspiration, an example to us. Um, and we see here, guys, that Celebrate Recovery is about more than just a substance addiction. It, it, it's helpful to spend time uh, with other Christians and under the leadership of people who have been through deep hurts, high hang-ups, addictions. Um, and you've also expressed, Hannah, that our, the, the church body, too, that you've been able to connect with people in your small group here. Praise God for that. That is God working through his people. Uh, but I'm going to ask Chris to come up one more time and because... I think, Chris, uh, there's people here that there, there is something, and they know what it is. I don't know what it is, but something is on a person's heart or mind here that God is telling them, you need to confess this. You need to turn this over to me. You need to confess this to other believers, but they're, they're afraid to do it. It's embarrassing, or they're worried about what's going to happen next, and they just wouldn't dream of coming out to a, a CR meeting or opening up to a Christian friend. Will you give us a, a sample teaching from CR? And I think that might help churn that up and maybe set people at ease to come out and, and see you guys. Awesome. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so here's a quick sample lesson for you guys. Uh, principle one says, realize I am not God. I admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Blessed are those who know they are spiritually poor. Matthew 5, 3 goes with that principle. And step one says, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors and that our lives have become unmanageable. 
Romans 7, 18 says, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. So inside your guys' pamphlets out there, you guys are going to have an acrostic. Uh, Subway Recovery came out of the Baptist movement, so there's acrostics for everything. It's a good one. All right, cool. The D stands for disables your feelings. If you're taking notes, and I hope that you are, the D stands for disables your feelings. Denying reality will always cost you, but accepting reality as it actually is gives you a fighting chance to change it. So two examples, one that are funny and one that's serious. Uh, the serious one is that in 1993, Tommy Morrison became the WBC heavyweight champion of the world by knocking out George Foreman. Huge day for him. To become the heavyweight champion is a very, very big, big, big deal. In 1996, Tommy had contracted HIV, and in 2006, he began to deny that he ever had HIV, period. And in 2013, he died due to complications related to HIV. Now, why that's so serious in respect to denying and disable your feelings is that after his death, ESPN released a bunch of articles highlighting that it wasn't actually HIV that had killed him, but it was denial. Magic Johnson has had HIV since the 80s. He's still kicking and doing really, really well. So it was his denial that cost him his life. Uh, the next is basically the first few weeks of American Idol. I mean, we can all agree on that one. But you know what's even worse? It's not the singer. Singer, yeah, that's bad. You can expect that from them, but their family. That denial is even worse because it's like, I feel like if, you know, that was my kid coming up to me, I'm like, you know, daughter, I love you. Uh, I, I'm so proud that you sing for your family here. It's awesome. Don't go on national television. You know, like, th that should be the conversation that should take place instead of, oh, man, you got this? You're going to go to the top. You know, that's just not true. So, you know, in their denial, they're not allowing the natural feelings and emotions to come that would allow them to process through what the right path is. So in their denial, they go from bad decision to worse. So disable your feeling is like, E stands for energy lost. Psalm 32.3 says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all the day long. Keeping a lie or a secret or an addiction or compulsive behavior going robs you of your life's vitality. Like picture it this way. If you guys, uh, you want a cross country trip, you fill up your gas tank, right? Then you head out and you're going to go to the expressway, whatever, and you hit that roundabout <clears throat> on Van Dyke and you just never get off. You just keep going around in circles and circles and circles. Two things are going to happen. One, you're never going to get where you want to go. And two, you're going to run out of gas because you're going hard in the wrong direction. That's what energy loss is. When you have to spend time denying things that are going on in your life, that is just going to end up costing you all of your energy because you're using it in the wrong way, in the wrong place. The N stands for negates growth. We are only as sick as our secrets. If someone receives news that they have cancer and then they decide that the test results and the doctors, everybody is just wrong, they're not going to get the help that they need and their, their, their healing will not come because they're denying that they're even sick. So there is no possible way to move forward in life if you're not admitting what's really going on and you're negating any kind of growth you would have. Like literally it's a waste of time to sit in these chairs if you're going to continually be in your denial. I mean, there's, there's good things out there like brunch. You know, we, we could totally hit that up. You know, not here, you know. So anyway, the I stands for isolates us from God. Isolates, that, that's the big one, man. That's the worst. Isolates us from God. God has no part with sin. God sent his only son to die on the cross for our sins. The Bible teaches that at our worst, Christ died for us. Our sins and our secrets will keep us away from enjoying the relationship with God that he does want for us. In Romans 5, 6, it says clear, for while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Like, Jesus died for sins. The very sins that we're trying to hide from others and from ourselves and whatever else. Like, that's what he came for, and it's going to isolate us from him because we're not admitting the truth in that. And so, uh, wise words from my dad when I was struggling so hard with, like, trying to be a Christian, but also partying at the same time, he said to me, you can't have your hands in both cookie jars. You just can't. You either have your, you're either all in with Jesus, or you're all in with the world, but don't be one on the other. Like, that's a waste of your time and his, right? I mean, that's just really what it is it comes down to. Um, yeah. The A stands for alienates us from our relationships. 
John Legend had a super popular song a few years ago, and some of the lyrics from it said, all of me loves all of you. And it could never be any, uh, anything, or we can never be all of anything if we're holding back something else and giving it somewhere else. You can't be in a, a solid relationship with somebody when you got things in between you. It just doesn't work that way. And uh, our lies and deceits and deception always get brought to the light. You know, some of us can go with like longevity and we'll get away with it for a while. We eventually get caught. Everyone always gets caught. Even if you get away with it, you still don't get away with it because God knows. Right? Alienates us in our relationships. And so, uh, if you're worried about letting people down when they find out about you and what you've been doing, uh, don't worry. You've already let them down by what you're doing. You're just prolonging it. Like, they're going to find out. It's going to happen. It's going to come to the light. Just bring it out there. That's what it is. It alienates us from our relationships. The L stands for lengthens the pain. Lengthens the pain. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to do judo. And uh, I was really, really good at it at the time. In 1997, I won first place in the California State Champion. Uh, it was awesome. Next year, I went to Colorado to uh, go to the Olympic Training Center out there and then compete on the state level there. Uh, I ended up getting second place there. Uh, but that night, when I got home or back to the hotel, I called my mom and I told her, she asked, how'd you do? How was your day? I told her I got first place. My mom is like ridiculously enthusiastic for her kids. I'm always the loudest guy in the room. My mom is like more than that, right? So she's like, for her kids, she's just crazy. She went and got a custom-made t-shirt that said number one Colorado State champ, right? Back when you could do that kind of thing, you know? And, and so uh, I get off the plane, she's got the post, you know, the post board and the balloons and everything. It's like super exciting time, right? My sensei's standing right there. <laughs> He's not unclear about what position I actually got. So I lost twice. <laughs> lost when I lost to that kid, and then I also lost when they, you know, I get found out that, yeah, and she told everybody to work. All my friends, family, everybody thought I got number one, and I look like an idiot because <laughs> I got number two, you know. So anyway, lengthens the pain. That's a cute story, but that's, you know, yeah. So anyway, I got a few minutes left. Here is the plea, all right? It's, this whole thing is leading you towards this. Like, here is the plea. CR is not for everyone. But everyone can certainly benefit from it. Um, if you're struggling with a particular sin or sins, give CR a try. You know, there's nothing more on a, a Thursday night that you'd be doing for that one hour. I mean, there's no, you know, what a Dancing with the Stars or something isn't on. Like, you know, it's just the one hour. Give it a try. Uh, if you feel like you're going to handle your issues on your own, you're too proud to step out and get help, I've got two things for you. Uh, one of them is um, the Bible, when describing the church, never uses terms of individuality. It's always used in community. Like, you're never meant to just be you on your own. We're here in a room together. It's a community that we're in. And the second thing is, if you're too proud, if you would have gotten rid of that sin, you, you would have done it by now. If you're still struggling with the same thing and you want to handle it on your own, you haven't done it, time's up. You know, give it a shot somewhere else. Uh, two, if you're uh, worried about what people will think of you, like if you fear judgment from other people, like what they're going to think if you get into recovery, two things also. If someone judges you for being a, a, a Christian and admitting your sin and taking steps and overcoming it, that says volumes more about them than it does about you. Like if you're pursuing getting help for what you got going on, like and there's someone's going to come against that, that's completely on them. Uh, and then two, if you fear their judgment, more than you fear the judgment of God, you've got a very, very low view of him. Because he's actually the one, like everyone, this blew my mind when I thought about this. Uh, he is eternal and all-powerful. Everyone in here, we're all temporary and finite. So I should never fear any of you guys and what you think of me more than what I fear and think of him. Like he's actually like, I'm going to stand before, bow before him one day. I'm not going to bow before any of you guys. So don't fear anything that anyone thinks about you. You're getting, you're taking the steps you need to get well. Obviously, whatever you're doing isn't working. You need to get that help. And that's what we're here for. So give yourself a chance. I know it's scary, and some of the bravest men and women I've ever met have the courage to walk through those doors and admit what's really going on. We're here for each other. That's, that's why we exist as a group. And that's why we exist as a church. You know, you got stuff going on? Cool, so do I. Let's talk about it. You know, that's okay. You know, um, anyway, thank you for, uh, for letting me share. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank both of you for, for coming up here and sharing your story with us. Uh, you really opened up, you know, uh, to us here today. And uh, I just want to give them a round of, of applause and thank one more time.
We're, we're going to have a closing song here. The band can come up and prepare for that. Thank you, guys. Um, like I said at the beginning, this life hurts, but God heals. But in order to take the first step toward healing, if there's something where you need healing in your life, the fir very first step is to surrender it to Jesus, to surrender yourself to Jesus. If you've never done that before, if you've never turned your life over to him, committed yourself to Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, today, right now, is the time to do that. We're going to have a, a closing song here. Do some business with the Lord. After we're done with this, this song, uh, Chris and Hannah are going to be down here after the service. Also, our, our senior pastor, Randy, and our prayer team will be down here. Uh, the next step in getting help is to confess to a brother or sister in the Lord that can encourage you, can pray for you, can keep you accountable. And that's, that's the ministry that Chris and Hannah do. That's what they do around here at Stony. All right? And of course, we've also got Randy and our prayer team. Come down and, and talk with someone. If you need some prayer today, you need to talk with someone. Hey, come on and do it. But start vertically. Start with the Lord. I, I love what Chris said. You know, we need to be more worried about what God thinks about us than what the person next to us thinks about us. All right? So take all those distractions out and spend some time with the Lord here in this closing song. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the, the ministry of Celebrate Recovery. I thank you for Chris and Hannah opening up to us today. And Lord, as we, we sing this last song to you, may it be a time of coming to our Lord, to Jesus, and confessing to him the things that we need to confess, our hurts, our habits, our hang-ups, whatever it is. And Lord, I pray, I pray that people will be receiving healing here this morning as they meet with you, as you meet with us here. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would stir in people to, to open up, to share, and to get uh, accountability and encouragement and help in their life to take steps forward so that uh, this time next month, this time next year, whatever we're struggling with today is something that, is, that we're walking in victory in Jesus on in a month and a year from now. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
here I stand. So here I stand, high in surrender. I need you now. Hold my heart now and forever. My soul. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your presence. God, we thank you for who you are. And God, who you are to each of us. And who you are to us as a church, as a community of believers together. We thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to dismiss here and, and you guys are free to go. But I do want to remind you that we're going to have the... Uh, Nelsons will be down front here as well as our pastoral prayer team. If you'd like to meet them, talk with them, and pray with anyone, please join us for that after, after you guys uh, are dismissed here. Have an awesome Sunday. We'll see you back here next week.